Welcome to You Have My Sword. In today's episode, we are talking about why Middle Earth needs better probation officers. We're talking about Melkor, or Morgoth. Totally not confusing at all. Let's talk about it. Before we jump in, we have a very fun listener question. Casey writes, do you know anything about why Tolkien hated Dune so much? <laughs> uh, I knew this question would enter my inbox uh, eventually, and with Dune, the, the new movie coming out, um, I think, what, tonight as I'm recording this? Um, I think it comes out tomorrow. Um, it's been a hot topic of discussion on literary internet where I frequent. Um, so yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> so Tolkien has been quoted as saying, uh, I dislike Dune with some intensity, right? But he did not give specific reasons why, but we have some context and commentary he has made about Dune and um, just commentary about writing in general. And I'll break that down as best I can. So Tolkien was interested in stories that were inherently good and involved hope and positivity. He was really a man about good conquering evil. He leaned into that trope heavily. Um, and he was realistic in his approach to this, right? So even in dark moments, the story should be a delight to the reader. And that was kind of his MO with writing. By Tolkien standards, Dune is quite gratuitous in its bloodthirstiness. Herbert is delighted to describe the debauchery of the Harkonnens, which feels gratuitous at times, um, which Tolkien would have likely found um, needless or trite. On a similar level, Tolkien always wrote in a way which was suitable for children. He, discuss he discusses this in tree and leaf. Um, he did not see any benefit in filling out his stories with sex and gore. Tolkien did feel a good story did not need to rely on those tropes. Also, let me interject here. I know I say Tolkien weird, um, but I went to public school in Florida. Let me fucking live. I accent everything poorly. I am a trash person. I know some people say Tolkien. That is correct. Tolkien, correct. I don't give a fuck how anybody pronounces anything. Fantasy words are hard, okay? Um, uh, and I know there's like a fucking Tolkien gang, a Tolkien gang. I feel like we need to respect each other. Just know that I'm aware. Trust me. Um, I hate my accent. <laughs> I hate my voice. I sound like a trash person. But just wanted to call attention to that since I've said Tolkien about 47 times already. Anyways, Tolkien's world is ultimately a world of grace and kindness. These, to Tolkien, were marks of the true hero, of whom Gandalf and Aragorn were the contrasting pinnacles here, right? So a lot of these virtues are almost entirely absent from Dune. And uh, also a, a big point, I think, is Tolkien loved languages, right? He plays with it endlessly, and there is an extraordinary sound to his prose if you read it out loud. Herbert has a cursory reference to some unique languages, but does not embellish on them. I can see this irking Tolkien. So Tolkien wasn't a huge fan of modernism. Dune is a child of modernism in a much clearer way than, say, um, Foundation or Islands in the Sky. Um, its philosophy is a blend of kind of like existentialism and proto-New Ageism, maybe nihilism and rationalist skepticism, right? I think that is a fair way to kind of infer Dune. So all of these would have seemed very barren and barbaric to Tolkien. Tolkien focuses more on true heroes, where Herbert focuses more on anti-heroes. Tolkien wasn't a fan of edgelords, it seems, so um, he would not have liked Dune on this alone. Above everything, though, Dune had been very publicly compared to and described as the science fiction equivalent of Lord of the Rings, which Tolkien felt was opposite in almost every respect. So, in short, 
Dune is full of things that Tolkien did not align with, morally, ethically, professionally, whatever. And having the book described as the equivalent of his own book must have gotten under his skin quite a bit. Although obviously people's praise and comparison was well-meaning, they just felt both books were iconic within their categories of fantasy and sci-fi respectively. I don't think anybody was doing it to slight Tolkien in any way. Um, and my personal opinion on Dune is I don't know if I like Dune or not. I will say that I have read Dune three times um, and I enjoy it because it is kind of good, like, chewy science fiction um but i also don't like dune for a lot of reasons i've listened to the dune audiobook one and a half times i've read children of dune um and it's weird i like like and don't like dune i think i like dune but i can understand why so many people don't like dune if that makes sense and there definitely is in my opinion better sci-fi oh perfect timing behemoth is using his litter box right next to me Oh, dude, you can finish your business. He heard me say his name and got out and ran. Nahimid, it's okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, so should we jump right into it then? Um, well, before we jump right into it, let's allow the man of the hour to introduce himself. I am the Elder King, Melkor, first and mightiest of the Valar, who was before the world and made it. The shadow of my purpose lies upon Arda, and all that is in its bends slowly and surely to my will. But upon all whom you love, my thought shall weigh as a cloud of doom, and it shall bring them down into darkness and despair. Wherever they go, evil shall arise. Whenever they speak, their words shall bring ill counsel. Whatsoever they do shall turn against them. They shall die without hope, cursing both life and death. So yeah, Melkor, otherwise known as Voglir, Belagur, Belagur, Black Hand, Black King, Dark King, Dark Lord, Dark Power of the North, Elder King, Great Enemy, King of the World, Lord of All, Giver of Freedom, Lord of the Dark, Lord of the Darkness, Master of Lies, Master of the Fates of Arda, Melko, Belcha, Melagor, Melico, Alband, Alcar, Mardello, and Manfreya Bulgan. A man of many stupid names, Melkor is a repeat offender in Middle-earth, largely in the First Age, and if you've been listening to my podcast from the jump, one, I'm sorry, two, thank you. And three, you probably already likely know a lot about Melkor due to his appearances in nearly every major plot point. My mans can't mind his business at all. So while we have been unraveling Melkor in his deeds across many episodes of the podcast, I'd like to add a little bit more color and context to this terrorist. We won't go into great detail about all the shit he got up to, as that is largely covered across many different episodes, but I'd like to fill in some historical gaps that focus on Melkor himself so we can better know his character. So I will preface again, I've done this before and I will do it again, just in case you are a new listener and this is the first episode that you chose to listen to. I go back and forth with calling him Melkor or Morgoth, and when I script, my episodes, I sometimes type Melkor and sometimes Morgoth. They are interchangeable. It means the same thing. We will kind of go into how his name evolved in this episode. But just if I say Melkor and Morgoth, no, it's the same person. Exactly. So Behemoth is here. He will be um, co-hosting this episode. So just bear with me. He's not very good at his job, um, but he shows up and that's important. Anyways, so, originally, the most powerful of the Einar, created by Eru Iluvatar, Melkor rebelled against his creator out of pride and sought to corrupt Arda. After committing many evils across the First Age and preceding eras, such as the theft of the Silmarils, which resulted in his name Morgoth, and the destruction of the two lamps and the two trees of Valinor, Morgoth was defeated by the host of the Valinor, aka the Middle-earth Avengers, in the War of Wrath. As punishment, he was banished from Arda into the void, though it was prophesied he would one day return. So, 
We will cover all of this in detail. So let's talk about his origin story. Like his origin origin story, right? Melkor was created by Iluvatar in the timeless halls at the beginning of creation. He was greater in power and knowledge than any of the other Ainur. Even his brother, who was Manwe and was known to be incredibly strong. Impatient with the emptiness of the void outside of the timeless halls and desiring to create things of his own, he often entered the void seeking the flame imperishable. Remember, this is the flame that gives creation's true life and only can be used by Iluvatar. So we know that the flame imperishable lives within Iluvatar. Iluvatar is the only being, he is God, he is the only being that can give life using this flame. You can, you can create things, but they will be abominations, right? You need the flame to give things true life, true spirit. So Melkor was searching for this flame because he wanted to go and get up to shit and create things, uh, but the flame was of Iluvatar and resided within him, and Melkor never discovered it. He continued to search, however, and as such was often alone and apart from his fellow Einar. It was during these lonesome periods that he began to have ideas and thoughts of his own that were not in accordance with his fellow Einar. But don't feel for him, though. He chose to be an incel. This, this is chosen. So I guess it would be a Valsel, right? <laughs> When the Einar sang the great music before Eru, he wove some of these alien thoughts into his music, and straightaway discord arose around him. Some of those nearby attuned their music to his until two musical themes were warring before the throne. To correct the discord, Eru introduced a second and then a third theme into the music, but Melkor succeeded in holding back the second theme of which Manwe was the chief instrument. The third was the theme of elves and men, and while it was not overwhelmed by the discord as the second theme was, it too failed to correct it. When Eru brought the music to an end, he rebuked Melkor, praising his strength but reminding him that, as an aspect of his creator's thought, anything that he could bring into being ultimately had its source within Eru himself. So, Eru, Iluvatar, was like, hey, I get it. You're strong. I'm impressed. But please remember, I'm the only one that can create life. So don't get ahead of yourself, dude. <laughs> As such, even the discord redounded in the end to the glory of Eru's work. This rebuke shamed Melkor, but brought on anger in him as well, although he did hide it. Thus, when the music was made incarnate as Arda, it was already flawed through the discord and a moderate heat and great cold stalked it. Melkor then took interest of the world and descended to it with the other Valar. So this is, uh, the, the, this whole music creation stuff can be a bit confusing if you're like, what the fuck is going on? So the, the music of Iluvatar is what created the world, right? The Velar and the Luvatar, they had this music to create the world, and that's how they created Arda, right? And the music shaped every aspect of this planet, both literally and figuratively. And because Melkor, spending so much time in, in the void by himself, he was um, becoming a Valsel edgelord, and his music was disruptive to the other's music, which was very pure, hence why Arda kind of became an inherently already kind of corrupted, imperfect place. So I hope that makes a little more sense, kind of like condensed. So his arrival in Arda. When the Valar entered into Arda and began to shape um, the unwrought matter, Melkor saw the field of Arda and claimed it for his own. However, the other Valar took Manwe to be their lord, for while Manwe was not nearly so powerful as Melkor, he understood the thought of Eru Iluvatar better than any of his peers. Bitter, Melkor set himself against the other Valar. Whenever the Valar worked to be better and better the world, Melkor disrupted their efforts. For a long while, Melkor fought alone against the might of all the other Valar and Maiar of Arda, and he long held the upper hand. So during this time, Arda was kept essentially shapeless as Melkor ruined virtually every early work that the other Valar attempted to create. 
Fortunately for them, the mighty Valar Tulkis eventually descended to Arda, and I believe he was the last to finally descend to Arda, um, and his strength tipped the balance in favor of the Valar. So Melkor fled before him and left Arda for uh, a brief time. After Melkor's departure, the Valar managed to quiet the tumults of the world and set about ordering it in preparation for the coming of the elves. So, to give light to the world, they constructed two great lamps in Middle-earth and set their place of dwelling in the middle of them, right? During this time, Melkor decided to re-enter Arda and with various Maiar spirits who had attuned themselves to his music and delved a mighty fortress at the very um, northmost part of the world and named it Autumno. So he came back with some fucking freak creatures that he created with his music um, and created a fortress in the northernmost part of the world thus far. To defend it, he raised the Iron Mountains as a ring around the north. So before they could begin to search for him, however, Melkor came forth from um, Autumno with sudden war and cast down the lamps. So he showed up like an absolute maniac and just started fucking shit up. So the fire within the lamp scorched a great portion of the world and containing the catastrophe caused by breaking kept the Valar occupied long enough for Melkor and his forces to retreat back to Autumno. So instead of the, instead of the Valar going off to, after Melkor, they had to fix the mess he made, right? So, you know, that allowed Melkor time to kind of run back to his, his fucking little fortress or whatever. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We know this fucker plotted to destroy the lambs and ultimately succeeded because he wanted to cast the world into darkness. That was his goal. After the, the destruction of the lambs, the Valar withdrew to the continent of Amon and there built Valinor. In doing so, however, they gave Melkor virtually free reign in Middle-earth. As a result, the continent languished in darkness and Melkor filled its lands with terrible creatures and decay. During this time, Melkor built his second, lesser fortress of Engband in the west, as a defense in the west should the Valar attack. Engband was delved into the Iron Mountains and was eventually given to Sauron to command. While the Valar were unsure where the children of Iluvatar would awake, they were reluctant to wage war against Melkor, fearing the clash of powers might result in massive collateral damage, the likes of which they had not seen since the lamps were destroyed. So they were like super playing it safe until the elves woke up because they did not want to fuck that up. As such, most of them remained in Amon and forsook Middle-earth. Due to this, Melkor discovered the elves before the other Valar could. So that's bad. Um, Melkor captured many of them and transformed them by torture and other foulcraft into the first orcs in mockery of the elves. So that's pretty fucked up and, uh, and unfortunate. Next, we'll move on to recap the War of Powers. I will try to recap this as best I can since we cover many portions of this across episodes. So, the War of Powers. It was discovered by the Vala. Arome, where the elves were, and the Valar took immediate action against Melkor, instigating the War of the Powers. The Valar overcame the host of Melkor, and he retreated into Autumno. After a grievous siege, the Valar kicked his goofy fort of darkness doors down, and Melkor was captured. Melkor was bound with Anganor, a sort of magic chain, and brought back to Valinor. There, he pleaded for pardon, but was cast into the Halls of Mandos for three ages. This was his probation period we like to joke about. I make this joke a couple times. Um, so I guess Mandos would be his probation officer then, right? <laughs> However, in their haste to overthrow Melkor, the Valar left many of Atumno's pits and vaults unexplored, and Sauron's dumbass remained at large. Additionally, they did not capture or destroy the Balrogs, who gathered at the ruins of Angband and went into a long hibernation awaiting Melkor's return. After the passing of the ages, Melkor was brought before Manwe and feigned repentance, as he often does. <laughs> Unable to comprehend the evil of Melkor, being himself free from it, Manwe ordered him released. So, 
Uh, not not a great move here on the Valar's part. <laughs> so at first it seemed as though the evil of Melkor had been cured, for all who sought his counsel and aid in that time benefited greatly from it. However, Tolkis and Onlo were both very slow to forget Melkor's evils and watched him very closely. In truth, Melkor was more filled with malice than ever and began to put his extraordinary cunning to use in devising a way to ruin Amon. Seeing the bliss of the elves and remembering that it was for their sake that he was overthrown, Melkor desired above all things to corrupt them. Of all three primary groups of elves, he found the Noldor to have a perfect balance of usefulness and open ears, and so he worked his malice almost exclusively among the Noldor. If you've been listening to season two so far, you know how this shit went. Not well, not fucking good. <laughs> Over a long period of time, he spread lies concerning the intentions of the Valar in bringing the elves to Amon, telling them, among other things, tales of the coming men, the existence of which the Valar had not revealed to the elves yet. Due to his carefully crafted lies, many of the Noldor began to believe that the Valar had brought them to Amon so that men might inherit Middle-earth, taking the lands and the glory that could have been theirs. So literally, the Valar saved the elves by bringing them over, right, um, to Amon to get them away from Middle-earth and away from Melkor. And Melkor is telling them, oh yeah, no, they, they saved you and brought you to Amon because they didn't want you to have Middle-earth. They don't think you're worthy. So fucked up, dude. <laughs> Eventually, a shadow fell upon the Noldor and they began to openly rebel against the Valar. Chief amongst them was the disgruntled Noldor was Feanor, the firstborn son of the Noldor king Finwë. Though he hated and feared Melkor, his overwhelming pride caused him to be the most vocal of the Noldor in expressing discontent. For their part, the Valar remained unaware of Melkor's work and saw Feanor as the source of the Noldor's unrest. Though perturbed, they let the situation continue until Feanor threatened his brother Fingolfin with violence, at which point the Valar summoned him to the Ring of Doom in Valinor to explain his unlawful actions. And just for context, the Ring of Doom was where the Valar gathered to hold council. So, long ass story short, Feanor's testimony revealed the lies of Melkor, and Tolkis immediately left the Ring of Doom to recapture him. But Melkor could not be found. After a time, Melkor went to Formanos and feigned friendship to Feanor in order to acquire the Silmarils. So, Melkor kind of fucked off hid for a little bit, and then kind of went and met up with Feanor and like played nice to kind of finesse him out of his jewelry, so to speak. But Feanor, seeing Melkor's greed, refused him and shut the doors of Formanos in the face of Arda's mightiest being. Melkor then passed unseen to the south and came upon Ungoliant. And again, if you've been listening, you'll know that he promised to sate her unrelenting hunger if she helped him on his quest to destroy the two trees, which replaced the two fucking lamps he already destroyed, only for Ungoliant to become even drunker with insatiable hunger and turn on Melkor. And it's worth noting again that Melkor was so fucking scared of this bitch that he shrieked so loud that it echoed for ages and woke up the hibernating Balrogs. I laugh out loud thinking about this shit sometimes, I will be honest. It is so funny. Okay, so to keep this quick, he ultimately goes to Formanos with Ungoliant and Melkor slays Finwë, father of Feanor, and seals the Silmarils and any other gems that were around, largely because Ungoliant wanted to feast upon them. The Silmarils burned Melkor's hands, but he refused to let go, and he and Ungoliant fled to the north, and the Valar chased them, but ultimately, they lost them. Anyway, so Melkor's plan essentially goes off without a hitch until he tries to screw over our girl Ungoliant, and she goes absolutely apeshit on him. It's cited that this is the most scared that Melkor has ever been. Um, so, like I said, he screams like a bitch, hands over the lesser treasure he stole, trying to hide the Silmarils for himself, but she demanded those as well, but he refused. <laughs> so she beat his ass, 
Weaving her dark webbing around him, he cries like a baby bitch, so much so that it awakens the hibernating Balrogs in the depths of Angband. They come swiftly to his aid, chasing Ungoliant away so he could go be an absolute fucking creep show somewhere else. Cut to Feanor, who just found his father slain. He cursed Melkor and thus named him Morgoth, meaning dark enemy. And by that name, he was known ever after. The name Melkor was never spoken again by his enemies. So that is how we go from Melkor to Morgoth. Okay? So, as Morgoth finished rebuilding Angband, the slag and debris created by his fast tunnelings was... Um, plied into three huge volcanoes, collectively known as Thangorodrum. Fun fact about Thangorodrum, it's one of my least favorite words to fucking say. How do you fucking say that shit? I hate it. I say it different every time. It's not good for me. Bear with me with that word, because I will say it 47 other times throughout this episode. Anyways, he hastened then to rebuild his forces, breeding innumerable orcs and other fell beasts. The Silmarils were mounted into the Iron Crown, which he wore around like a fancy little baby. So I'm going to try, try my fucking best to summarize shit that goes down in the first age after the fallout of all this Silmaril theft. But I tell you what, shit do be happening all the time, always with this guy. And a lot I've covered in past episodes, um, I will probably repeat again, so just bear with me. I will try to keep it as concise, but as informative as possible. Cut to Feanor. He's pissed as hell. Followed Morgoth to Middle-earth with the greater part of the Noldor in rebellion, hoping to recover his Silmarils. This action triggered the tragic War of the Great Jewels, in which the elves would be utterly fucking defeated in the end. Upon learning of the arrival of the Noldor in Middle-earth, Morgoth sent enemies and hordes of orcs against Feanor's host, hoping to destroy them before they could establish any viable defenses. Though the Noldor were outnumbered, they swiftly and completely destroyed the orcs. Only a handful returned to Angband. But Feanor, in his pride and arrogance, thought to come at Morgoth himself and pursued them on some dog the bounty hunter shit. Soon, he and his vanguard drew far ahead of the main host, and the orcs, seeing this, turned and gave battle at the gates of Angband. Due to their proximity to Angband, a number of Balrogs emerged to aid the orcs, and the elves along with Feanor were, were very quickly killed, needless to say. Feanor fought on alone, but was eventually stuck, struck down by Gothmog, the lord of the Balrogs, though a relief force under the command of his son saved him from being killed on the field of battle, um, Feanor did unfortunately later die um, due to his wounds. Shortly after Feanor's death, Morgoth sent an embassy to the Noldor offering terms of surrender, even promising a Silmaril. Long story short here, Feanor's heir, Maedros, agreed to the parley, but both sides were sus as fuck about these terms. Um, and so they both came to the meetup with greater forces than was initially agreed upon, resulting in the elven company being completely slain as Morgoth rolled up with a huge army and Balrogs. So Majoros was captured and chained by his right hand to one of the Thangorodrim's many cliffs as Morgoth sent word to the Noldor, promising his release on the condition that the elves would fuck off with their attempts against him. The elves, finally wising up to his shit, knew he would not hold up his end of the bargain and sent no reply. Fully fucking ghosted, right? Around this time is when the Valar revealed the creation of the sun and the moon, which confounded Morgoth. Since Morgoth couldn't destroy the lights for a third time, he simply veiled himself against it by creating clouds of smoke from the Iron Mountains to keep his realm dark. My man's bought blackout curtains for his entire realm. During the time of confusion and inaction among Morgoth's forces by these new lights, Fingon traveled to Angband, aided by the very darkness Morgoth had set upon his realm, and rescued Maedros. In doing so, he set into motion a series of events that united the Noldor and allowed them to establish mighty kingdoms in Beleriand and Hithlum. When Morgoth initiated his next offensive, the Noldor swiftly and completely destroyed his forces and set a siege upon Angband, hoping to forever contain the evil of Morgoth. 
So Morgoth made trial of his foes, causing the Iron Mountains to erupt and sending an army of orcs down through the passes, but to no avail, for the orcs were easily defeated by the Noldor in the Dagor Aglareb, which was the name of the third great battle in the War of the Jewels. Also, I hate saying that word too. Fuck that word. Anyways, after this failure, Morgoth said fuck it and took to capturing what elves he could, breaking them with the power of his will and chaining their lives to his. These elves became his spies among the Noldor and they kept him appraised of the movements and plans of his enemies. Cut to 100 years later, Morgoth sent an army into the north to approach Hithlum from the side, but an army under the command of Fingon destroyed them yet again. At this point, Morgoth came to realize that the orcs, unaided, were simply no match for the Noldor, and began experimenting with ways to create deadlier creatures um, for his armies. Cut to 100 years later, Morgoth sent an army into the north to approach Hithlum from the side, but an army under the command of Fingon destroyed them yet again. At this point, Morgoth came to realize that the orcs unaided were no match for the Noldor and began experimenting with ways to create deadlier creatures for his armies. Some time later, when men first arrived in Beleriand, it was revealed that Morgoth had left Angband and walked among the fathers of men, hoping to no doubt corrupt them to his service. He began to spread his lies among them and found them to be considerably easier to sway than the elves had been. However, the strengthening of the elven kingdoms worried Morgoth and he returned to Angband before his labors were complete. Nevertheless, most men believed or half believed his lies and either departed from the north or joined with Morgoth's forces. However, a small group of men that became known as the Edain resisted him. They strengthened the siege of Angband as many settled in the north of Beleriand, adding to the strength of the Noldor. Now, it's about 455 years since Fingolfin came to Middle-earth and Morgoth deemed that the time was ripe to destroy the elves and their allies once and for all. One cold winter night when the elven watch was least vigilant, Morgoth sent forth terrible rivers of fire and lava from Thangorodrum and poisonous fumes from the Iron Mountains. The elves were completely unprepared for such an assault and a great many Noldor perished. Thus began the Battle of Sudden Flame. The siege of Angband was swiftly broken and the forces of the elves were scattered. So swift and overwhelming was Morgoth's assault that the various elven kingdoms were unable to marshal their forces in any sort of unified front, and as such, Morgoth was able to engage the elven forces in a piecemeal fashion, greatly blunting the effectiveness of any resistance, right? So, with the exception of Maedros and his fortress upon the hill of Himring, the sons of Feanor and Finarfin were overthrown and utterly defeated. Fingolfin and Fingon only just barely managed to defend Hithlum from Morgoth's onslaught, as the mountains surrounding it provided a pretty effective barrier against Morgoth's fires. Cut to Fingolfin, believing the Noldor to have been defeated beyond any hope of recovery, he rode forth alone from Hithlum to the gates of Angband in a wrath so potent that he was said to have resembled Arome himself, Arome being one of the Velar and a very powerful one. So when he pulled up, he smote upon the doors of Morgoth's fortress, challenging the Dark Lord to come forth and 1v1 him, bro. Morgoth said, hey, I'm good on that, thanks. But Fingolfin's challenge was heard by all in Angband and was given in such an insulting manner that to ignore it would have been to lose face before his captains. It's like Fingolfin put Morgoth in a position that if he didn't want to be one him, he would look like a pussy in front of his entire army. Morgoth, peer pressured by his homies, issued forth in black armor from Angband to confront Fingolfin. Wielding the terrible hammer Grand, Morgoth repeatedly attempted to smite the elven king, but succeeded only in carving many fiery pits in the ground from his missed strikes. Fingolfin long managed to avoid Morgoth's blows and wounded the Dark Lord seven times. But at last, Fingolfin grew weary and Morgoth got three good hits in. 
Fingolfin arose each time to continue the fight, but eventually he fell backwards into one of the many pits formed by Morgoth's hammer. Morgoth then set his foot upon Fingolfin's neck and killed him. But not before Fingolfin, with his last stroke, hewed Morgoth's foot with his sword. Then Morgoth broke the elf's body and prepared to feed it to his wolves, but Thorondor, the king of the eagles, swooped down upon Morgoth, marring his face with his talons, and rescued the body of the elf king. Fingolfin's last stroke gave Morgoth a permanent limp, and the pain of his seven wounds could not be healed, nor were the scars ever erased. However, despite his great victory, Morgoth had made a critical mistake. What's that mistake? you ask? So great had been his malice and his desire to destroy the elves that he had struck before his plans were fully realized, and in his hatred and contempt he had underestimated the resolve and valor of his foes. Now Morgoth found that the elves and Edane, recovering from the initial shock of his onslaught, had begun to make small gains against his outlying forces. Morgoth sent out many spies, and he sent messengers to men feigning pity. When the Edain refused his false offers of peace, he summoned the Easterlings over the Blue Mountains to harass them. Seven years passed before Morgoth renewed his offensive. He assailed Hithlum with great strength, but just as he was on the verge of victory, Círdan and a host under his command came at the last moment and helped Fingon to turn the orcs back. Morgoth became aware pretty quickly that Maedroth was making a great play against him and driving his orcs off the northern heights of Beleriand. As such, he took counsel against them and prepared his forces for a major confrontation. When the elves eventually made it to Angbad, the Battle of Nirnaeth Arnodiad began. Say that three times fucking fast, right? Ultimately, and unfortunately, the battle was a complete and decisive victory for Morgoth. The power of the elves and their Edain compatriots to make war against Morgoth was utterly and permanently broken. All of the great kingdoms of the Noldor and Beleriand, except Gondolin and Nagrothrand, were destroyed, and Hithlum was at last taken as well. The Edain who did not flee were enslaved by the Easterlings. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the fall of Gondolin. Morgoth hated and feared the house of Fingolfin most among the houses of the sons of Findway, especially Fingolfin's son Turgon, and it was prophesied that his doom would come from the house of Turgon. So remember this, this is important, right? It's called foreshadowing, baby. Following Turgon's escape from the Nirnaeth Arnodiad, Morgoth sought to find and destroy the last of the free kingdoms of the Noldor, Gondolin, where Turgon reigned, um, was at the top of his list. So to just jump right into the meat of it, Morgoth assailed Gondolin. Morgoth's forces advanced upon the city nearly undetected during um, a time of festival and over the mountains where the watch was least vigilant. So by the time the elves even realized uh, what was going on, the city had been laid to waste by Morgoth's overwhelmingly superior forces. So, with the sacking of Gondolin and the defeat of the Noldor and their allies, Morgoth's long-sought triumph was complete, like, finally and for real. The great kingdoms of the elves had fallen, save for the Isle of Belar and the survivors at the mouths of Syrian, which were ruled by Arendelle, and Morgoth esteemed them as, you know, nothing to worry about. He was not concerned about taking these cities because he did not... Um, he did not find them dangerous. Uh, spoiler alert, though, he should have worried. Let's talk about his final defeat, okay? This is fun stuff. Let's jump into Morgoth's eventual and final defeat for real, for real this time. So, persuaded by Arendelle to take pity on the elves and Edain, the Valar soon decided to come to Middle-earth and confront Morgoth's tyranny. And just for context, Arendelle is our super dreamy elf airship captain, right? He's the one that eventually finesses one of the Silmarils from Morgoth, and it ends up as a star in the sky. So, anyways... Unable to understand compassion, Morgoth did not expect that the Valar would ever aid the Noldor after their evil deeds. 
remember, the Noldor rebelled against the Valar, hence their exile. So forgiveness is a powerful thing, y'all. The Valar mustered their forces and a great tumultuous battle occurred between Morgoth and the host of Valinor. Morgoth emptied all of Angband and his devices and engines and armies of slaves were so various and powerful that the fighting spilled across all of Beleriand. In the end, Morgoth's forces were utterly defeated. The Balrogs were destroyed, save some few that fled and hid themselves in caverns at the very roots of the earth. And the orcs were um, pretty much totally fucking slaughtered. Morgoth had one last trick up his sleeve in the form of a monstrous winged dragon. From out of the pits of Angband they issued, and so sudden and ruinous was their attack with great power and a tempest of fire that they drove back the hosts of the Valar. Um, so it's worth mentioning that Morgoth kind of created dragons, right? Or at least these winged dragons, and so that was kind of like, that that was kind of like his last resort, right? Is to kind of pull out <laughs> his his fucking dragons. But Arendelle came with Vingalit, his fucking sick-ass airship, accompanied by Thorondor and all the great birds in Arendelle, slew and Caligon the Black, whose great bulk fell upon the towers of Thangorodrim, breaking them in his ruin. If you're new to You Have My Sword or missed it, I do an episode on Encalagon the Black where you can get full context of this battle. That's in season one. So, Morgoth was finally, for real this time, defeated, no cap, like fully done. He fled into the deepest of his minds and sued for peace and pardon, you know, as he fucking loves to do. But the Valar crippled him and cast him upon his face. He was bound with the chain, Anganor, and his iron crown was beaten into a collar for his neck. And he was taken from the earth and thrust through the door of night into the timeless void. Free band names for anyone looking to start a heavy gaze band, by the way. So the two remaining Silmarils were finally recovered from him. So while Melkor was finally defeated and cast away from the world itself, Melkor's lies sowed in the hearts of elves and men, spawned a seed that did not die and could not be destroyed. So Sauron, his most powerful servant, remained loyal to his master's memory, thus becoming the second Dark Lord. After his first defeat during the Second Age, Sauron was held prisoner in Numenor, but, na but managed to corrupt the king, Arpharazan, and his followers into worshipping Melkor as a god. Melkor's taint of Arda was more than symbolic as, like the One Ring with Sauron, Melkor's dispersed a great portion of his essence into Middle-earth, and like the One Ring, Arda became the physical container for Melkor's spirit and will. So unfortunately, Arda um, kind of through Melkor's initial discord through the music that he made that was not pure and then all the corruption during his fucking <laughs> tyranny <laughs> over the ages has uh, just essentially left Arda um, in, in, in a state of corruption, right? While Melkor lost a great deal of strength infusing his essence into Arda so he could increase his hold over the world, it also meant that even banished, his evil would still permeate everything and corrupt the creatures of Arda. There are even hints in Tolkien's writing and notes that Melkor could even reach out from the void and make his voice heard like a silent whisper, tempting the children of Iluvatar towards evil. Or, at the least, his essence acted like an echo and similarly to the One Ring had its own dark will that served Melkor's ends um, in his steed, right? So according to material in some of Tolkien's writings um, compiled but not published by his son, in the last days, um, Melkor will learn how to break the door of night and re-enter the world and initiate the Degor Degoreth or the Battle of Battles. However, the published Silmarillion does not include this information and instead asserts that if the Valar know how the end of Arda will present itself, they have not revealed it. So there is kind of like a canon-y 
thing about him returning and, um, you know, was prophesized that he could return, which is kind of fun to think about. I like that Tolkien kind of left that a little bit open. Uh, but yeah, so my man's finally got defeated. We'd love to see it. And that's it. And with that, that pretty much sums up our big titty Morgoth girlfriend. And as always, please visit youhavemysword.podcast.com for links to all socials. And you can find us over at Patreon under You Have My Sword if you'd like to support. It helps to make it feasible to keep doing this podcast. And it also grants you access to my Discord where I'm not quite sure what's going on, but I like what I see. Again, please feel free to write in with anything you think could be fun to read on the show, as you've likely learned by now. There's no rules. Go ape shit. Thank you guys, and as always, you have my sword. And thanks for nothing, behemoth! Edgewick's Nebula.